Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much for inviting me to speak at this uh, occasion. So, first, um, so the first part of my talk is a tribute to Partha. It's pretty much left as it was in 2001, 2002, when I met him. Uh, I was, uh, well, a little bit earlier, a few years before that, I was uh, in Princeton, uh, a member at the Institute for Advanced Study. Martin Novak was my boss, and Partha was a visitor uh, at the Institute for Advanced Study. And uh, uh, the three of us uh, developed um, this framework of describing the evolution of language. And it was a collaboration between an evolutionary biologist uh, a computer scientist and a linguist and an applied mathematician. And so we all contributed different parts uh, to this work. And uh, I must say that my collaboration with Partha was one of the most inspirational ones. Uh, it, it, we were there at the Institute in the woods working late at night by the blackboard, scribbling on the blackboard for hours. And uh, I could just see those ideas, you know, popping up in the air and I could see how Parta's mind was working. It, it was uh, 10 years ago and uh, I've never had a collaboration like this ever since. Uh, so this work uh, was done, it was very interesting. And in the second part of the talk, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, some new stuff uh, that I added, and, but it, it's all due to this work. So why work on language evolution? because the Linguistic Society of Paris officially banned any work on language evolution at the meeting in 1866. Because one view is that language came as a byproduct of a big brain. And another view is that language emerged suddenly by one gigantic mutation. Language is remarkable. It gives us unlimited expressibility. There are infinite, infinitely many grammatically correct sentences. If you think about it, let's suppose that there is a finite number of grammatically correct sentences. Let's say the longest of those sentences. And then add, he said, at the end. And that makes it longer. So that proves you mathematically there is an infinite, infinite number of uh, sentences. You know about 60,000 words, which means that you learned about one new word per hour for the first 16 years of your life. Speech production is the most complicated mechanical motion we perform. Speech comprehension occurs at impressive speed, uh, up to 50 phonemes per second. Talking is totally effortless. We can speak without thinking. Uh, there are about 6,000 languages uh, on the face of Earth. And there's no simple language. So cultures and the levels of technology differ by the level of sophistication. But they say that languages, all, all languages uh, are as complicated as one another. So um, language uh, can be viewed as the last of a series of major events that changed the rules of evolution. So we had, so this graph shows you major events in billions of years ago. Four billions of years ago, origin of life, RNA, DNA, proteins. Prokaryotes occurred very long time ago. A lot, much time passed be before eukaryotes. Uh, appeared. So these are like bacteria, these are like other cells. Multicellular organisms appeared relatively recently. And th in this time scale, language appeared. And language can be viewed as a different way of recording and passing on information other than genetic. Okay. Um, and it's the similarity between a genetic transfer of information and a non genetic transfer of information that became. Um, the basis of this theory of language evolution. So the goals of this research program were to provide interf interface between evolutionary biology, linguistics, and mathematics, and to show how natural selection can guide the gradual emergence of coherent communication. So we want to explain, explain language in terms of evolution. Uh, so. Uh, there are some notions that uh, Partha explained to us at the time, and that became part of this talk. So what's grammar? Grammar is the computational system of language. Uh, so syntactic alphabet consists of a finite number of symbols, for instance, zeros of ones, or, for instance, all the words in a language. That's a finite number of symbols. Consider the set of all possible strings that can be made out of these symbols. A grammar is a rule system that specifies which strings are allowed. So, these are 
all possible sentences. And if you're a native speaker, you can pretty much always tell if it's grammatically correct or not. So grammar tells you which ones are allowed. Okay. Although there, it, it's not as simple as that. There is, there is some gray area, even for native speakers. But uh, more or less, grammar tells you whether, whether you're on the right side or on the wrong side. Uh, another view of grammar uh, is a mapping between semantics and syntax, right? So these are all the syntactic forms or all the sentences, and these are meanings. And the ones in this huge matrix, infinite matrix, provide, uh, you know, a link between the two. Um, so grammar acquisition is something that was of great interest to all of us. Uh, children acquire the grammar of their native language by hearing grammatical sentences. This is only a small part of all possible sentences, obviously, because all possible sentences comprise an infinite set. Um, this information does not uniquely determine the underlying grammatical rules. Nevertheless, children reliably acquire the correct grammar. So this phenomenon is called poverty of stimulus, or paradox of language, ac language acquisition. So uh, what does it mean to learn a rule of a language? A teacher generates a number of examples or applications of this rule, and the learner tries to figure out what the rule is. So uh, if you put in the computer science terms, uh, learning is inductive inference. And it's different from memorization of the correct sentences, because it gives you a power to generalize and to, to utter new sentences that you've never heard before. Uh, so I'm, I'll give you an example uh, why this is a paradox. So I, I have a rule. I know the rule that generates certain integers, given an input. I will give several examples of this rule, and you guess that rule. So input 2, output 1, 1. Input 3, output 1, 1, 1. Input 4, output 1, 1, 1, 1. Input 6, what's the output? Oh, you think you know, right? This is the output, and this is the rule. Given x, we calculate this. Um, so once I was giving this uh, 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 talk, and uh, only once in my career, a Hungarian mathematician said that this was completely obvious. Right? So, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so the rule is uh, the grammar of the language. So that, that toy example demonstrated that I, if I know the rules, I, I know the uh, rules of the grammar, right? And the examples are uh, the sentences that I utter that obey this rule. And you have to guess what the rule was. And I just demonstrated to you that it's impossible. Right? Uh, Open-minded guessing does not work. The, mathemat the mathematical framework is given. Uh, uh, so th there is a theorem, and in fact, a whole mathematical area of research that tells you that no algorithm uh, can learn such a rule given no restrictions. Um, so. We conclude that children, because th we know that the children somehow guess the rules, because they master the grammar. So they, they uh, could not guess the correct grammar if they had no preformed or innate expectation. And we call this innate expectation universal grammar. And Noam Chomsky was uh, the one who or originated uh, this idea. So what is universal grammar? Somehow all of us, when I gave you the example, believed that this was the rule. This is a mathematical in interpretation of the rule one, 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 one. You know, the number of ones is equal to the input that I give you. Uh, so we know that this is possible somehow. And this rule is impossible. We would have never guessed it. So um, somehow we have a set of possibilities that we consider, and others we exclude. And this is what we call universal grammar. So we have candidate grammars, possible grammars that could be deduced from the input. Uh, and this helps us formalize the process of learning by imagining a bunch of grammars which are intersecting sets. Okay? And we have to somehow uh, also equip uh, uh, the agent, the learning agent, with a learning mechanism. He has to figure out which grammar it is, given the input. Okay, so the environmental input is sample sentences. Let's suppose that uh, one sentence falls there, and the next one is here. So after a while, it becomes obvious somehow that it's G2 
is the correct grammar. And now the learner can generalize or utter new sentences from the same grammar, right? Um, so that's the process of learning. Uh, so universal grammar consists of, uh, consists of search space of candidate grammars and the uh, learning mechanism. And we consider two uh, types of learning mechanisms that Partha suggested, memoryless learner and batch learner. These are favorites with computer scientists. Um, so memoryless learner uh, starts with a randomly chosen grammar and stays with the current guess as long as the sentences that are uttered are compatible. As soon as he sees that the input sentence is incompatible with his current choice, he picks another grammar at random. And he could even go back to a grammar that he's already rejected. He has no memory. Okay? And he does it for a while and stops after n sentences. Uh, and well, hopefully, after n sentences, uh, if n is large enough, uh, there is a good chance that he will converge to the correct grammar. Um, the batch learner is, uh, in some certain sense, an opposite algorithm. He memorizes all n sentences. And then at the end, he decides which grammar is the most consistent with all these sentences. This is a very efficient learner compared to the previous one, but he requires an infinite memory. Okay. So it's not known how humans uh, perform their learning tasks. Uh, but it's hypothesized that the human algorithm is somewhere between memoryless learner and batch learner. We're not as silly as this, but we're not as efficient as this. So in some sense, if we get bounds on this and this, this will be lower and upper bound on what humans do. Um, so convergence of individual learning algorithms. Uh, so that was a mathematical task, right? To calculate how quickly an algorithm converges. Uh, let's suppose we have n grammars, and the teacher uh, spits out n sample sentences, n capital. Uh, and we consider a pairwise similarity between grammars. So G, I, G, J are two grammars. They intersect somehow. And the measure of that intersection, it's an asymmetric uh, function, uh, will, is called uh, pairwise similarity. It tells you pretty much the probability that uh, if I speak G, I, uh, and I say a sentence, then the speaker of G, J will understand. What's the probability of that? So that's the measure of intersection. So um, we assume that pairwise similarity of grammars is, the, is a random variable taken from a certain distribution because we don't know how real languages, you know. So we, 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 take, we, we just make a, an arbitrary distribution. And the question is how many sample sentences does on average a learner need to learn the correct grammar with a certain confidence? How many input sentences do I need? And um, this is a very interesting uh, mathematical problem which I think I'll skip. Uh, and um, I'll give you the answer for uh, the memoryless learner. This is the most interesting one. So um, if you don't assume anything special about the probability distribution of pairwise similarities, um, then the number of sentences that need to be uttered is proportional to n log n, where n little is the number of possible candidate grammars. So if I have a huge selection of different grammars that could be the correct grammar. It takes longer to, to converge onto the right one. Okay, and it's uh, okay. So, and we also have an answer. So this was for the memoryless learner. For the batch learner, it's much fa it, it's it's somewhat faster. It's n. Okay. So um, now, how does evolution come in here? We so far have talked about the. Uh, um, traditional computer science approach to uh, learning. There is a teacher and learner pair, a teacher and a learner. Teacher says sentences, learner uh, guesses the grammar. So now we go to population learning. learning. We consider a heterogeneous population of teachers and learners and the evolutionary dynamics that occurs from generation to generation. And we see how the language involves, uh, evolves. Um, so Let's suppose that we have a, a large number of individuals. They reproduce and die. Children learn the language of their parents. So individual learn, learning comes in here. Uh, learning is not perfect due to errors uh, of learning or innovations. Maybe I don't want to learn the correct language. Right? Maybe I want to invent something new. So that's 
uh, an imperfection of learning. Uh, and we, we will also assume that ability to communicate well is associated with biological fitness. So somehow if I can communicate better than others, it gives me a small, very small increment uh, in my fitness. Maybe I will be able to teach more children my language, okay, because it's more efficient. Uh, so everybody starts off by speaking all different languages. We, could, we just assume that as an initial condition. And the coherence is low. Nobody understands anybody very much. We run the evolutionary process. And uh, under some circumstances, we can hope that the system might self-organize and converge to uh, a population where everybody speaks the same language. Okay. So uh, what is the fitness? Let's suppose that I speak I and someone else uh, I speak with speaks J. Okay, so this is the probability that he understands me. This is the probability that I understand him. Let's uh, take the average of that. And we assume that this is the payoff I receive from talking to this person. Okay, the more I understand and the more he understands, the better it is for both of us. Okay, that's, uh, it's a simplistic assumption which can be relaxed later. And so we can write down the equations that uh, this is an ordinary differential equation that governs the evolution of different languages. So uh, if languages go from 1 to n, this is the frequency of language i in the population. Okay, So this is a derivative of the frequency. And this is how it's updated. So to, to have uh, a, a person speaking language i in the next generation, a parent with language j should reproduce, and that happens at, with his fitness, okay, proportional to his fitness, and then he should teach. Uh, he speak, the parent speaks J, and he teaches his child language I. Okay, so I have this matrix, which we can make assumption upon, that your parent speaks J, and you speak I. If this matrix is uh, a unity matrix, then it means that you can only learn exactly the language of your parent. So they will, they will, will not be... Uh, the, the only non-zero terms will be the terms with ii, right? And this whole summation will collapse onto uh, just one term. However, um, okay, I'll talk about it uh, in a second. So fitness, what's the fitness of parent j? Uh, if I speak uh, language j, uh, let me speak with everybody in the population and calculate how much... Um, payoff I get from that, how much understanding I have with the rest of the population. So my fitness depends on the uh, present composition of the population, what languages are spoken at the moment. So this is this. Uh, and uh, as I said, QIJ is the probability that the learner will acquire uh, GJ from a teacher with I. Okay. So uh, this last term is... Uh, the average fitness of the whole population, or what, what we can call grammatical coherence. It's added uh, because we want to assume that uh, there is certain um, competition among the individuals in the population, so they can just grow to infinity. Uh, so we have two main evolutionary processes uh, as dictated by Darwinian theory, selection and mutations. Selection is because individuals reproduce uh, proportion to their fitness not all at the same uh, 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 rate. And mutation is uh, the, uh, the possibility of change. Okay, so what are these mutations? Um, if uh, J and I are languages which are very close to each other, this could be ascribed to uh, le learning mistakes or innovations, right? And very far off diagonal terms could be taken zero. But in general, we have this matrix. And we have a nonlinear third order, non sparse system of ordinary differential equations to solve. Um, and uh, it's a th this system is a relative of two other well known systems in evolutionary biology. So if there are no mistakes, I told you this term collapses to one, it's called a replic replicator equation, no, no mutation in the system. And if the fitness doesn't depend on who else is in the population, then we have this much simpler system. Uh, it has a lower degree of nonlinearity. So let's run the dynamics. And let's suppose that there are no learning mistakes. Okay? Uh, then after a while, uh, 
all the population will converge to one language. So if these are the languages, and, this, and these are frequencies of how often they're spoke, spoken in the population, everybody will speak the same language. And there'll be exactly n stable one grammar solutions. It could be this language, or it could be that language. In physics, they call it localized solution. Now, let us uh, add some mistakes of learning. So there's a possibility that I learn from somebody and but uh, end up speaking something slightly different. So this solution disappears, and I have a solution like this. It's uh, uh, it becomes a little wider. So uh, not just one language is spoken in the population, but some variants of that language also exist. Okay, and uh, let me increase the probability of mistakes. This becomes wider. I increase the probability of mistakes even more, and it disappears. In a sharp transition like this, all of a sudden, there is no localized solution anymore. It's a phase transition, like in physics, from you know, liquid to solid. Um, all of a sudden, if, if the people cannot retain the language of their teacher, uh, after a certain threshold, the grammatical coherence disappears, and there is no language anymore. Everybody speaks whatever they want, and it's, it serves no purpose. So uh, when the learning accuracy is low, all grammars are present and coherence is low. Uh, so, and for high learning accuracy, there is a one grammar equilibria. There are one grammar equilibria where most people speak exactly the same grammar and coherence is high. Uh, so, I can relate the number of mistakes uh, the children make in learning the language to the number of sample sentences they receive. So if they receive a lot of sampling sen sentences, then the convergence of the individual learning algorithm is high. And they will almost certainly will acquire exactly the language of their parents. If the number of sentences, sample sentences is lower, then there will be more mistakes. Okay? So we can plot uh, the solutions, the st stable steady states of uh, this system of ODEs as a function of the number of learning events. Okay, so if uh, the children receive enough learning events, any of these uh, languages can become spoken in the population. So these are uh, all equilibria that are simultaneously stable in the system. And uh, you converge to just one of them at a time, depending on the initial conditions. But all of them, all of them are in principle possible. But if the number of learning events is too small, then the mistakes are too large, and it's impossible to maintain a coherent language. So we have this solution, which corresponds to everybody speaking just different language. Okay, so we have a certain threshold, coherence threshold. Um, and this coherent threshold does not depend on the size of the universal grammar that you can prove. So here is um, uh, the questions that we ask when we study population learning. So it, in individual learning, how many sample sentences does one need in order to learn the correct grammar with confidence D? Okay, so we solve that problem. That's the problem between one, one teacher, one learner. In population learning, how many sample sentences do children need in order to, for the whole population to be within D of perfect coherence, right? So it's a population question. And uh, if, the if the accuracy of learning is high enough, or if the number of sample sentences is large enough, then the population can develop and maintain a coherent grammatical system. So uh, th this relates the individual learning problem with the evolutionary problem where the, pop the language develops uh, in the whole population. So the question is, how is the coherence sense related to the complexity of universal grammar? So for, remember I told you for the population of memoryless learners, those silly ones that have this very inefficient learning mechanism, the number of sample sentences that they need to learn with a good accuracy goes as n log n. Okay? And uh, in, in this equation, somehow, the lifestyle of the biological species and the linguistics come together in this one equation. So the lifestyle is how many sentences a mother uh, others uh, during the child's you know, uh, uh, period of language acquisition. Uh, it depends on the life lifestyle and the type of interactions that the parents have with their children. And this little n is an abstract concept that comes from the notion of universal grammar and linguistics, right? This is how big the universal grammar is. And they're related in this one equation, or in this equation. 
this, this equation was derived for memoryless learners. This equation was derived for the efficient batch learners. We are presumably somewhere in between. Okay. So, and on the left, the number of sample sentences de defined by lifestyle. The little n on the right is complexity of universal grammar. Okay. Um, and that the idea here is that this n has to be greater than one of these thresholds for the grammatical speech to evolve and be able to be maintained in the population through the generations. So let me plot the, the same thing as a graph. We can look at the size of the universal grammar, little n, and the level of grammatical coherence that I get in the population. If the universal grammar is small, it's easy to learn. The mistakes are not so large, we have coherence. If the universal grammar is too huge, then we cannot learn it well. There are too many mistakes. Uh, speech, uh, the grammatical co coherence is impossible. The language is impossible. It will never evolve. So uh, the very large size of the universal grammar is incompatible with e evolution of language. Okay, so our conditions specify the maximum complexity of universal grammar compatible with evolution. And this is a necessary, co necessary condition for universal grammar to evolve by natural selection. Okay. So uh, this is the end of uh, the uh, theory that we developed some years ago. There are some extens extensions of it. And uh, in the next part of my talk, I will talk about one of the extensions kind of 10 years later. Okay, it's, it's a curious extension. I, I added it because it's probably something that you haven't seen. Uh, it's a work done in collaboration with Simon Levine in 2010, and it's about eavesdropping. Okay, so we take the same theory, and we, uh, you know that language is very complex. The theory that I presented before only takes account of the bare bones of uh, what's there. There are so many different layers, layers of language that are not in that theory. So we, we just try to add other complications to see what happens, right? So here we concentrate on eavesdropping. So to set up the problem, I tell you that eavesdropping is very common in nature, more common than, than I have thought. So vervet monkeys respond to alarm calls of uh, starlings. Those see a predator, they call, and monkeys um, pick up those uh, calls. They understand them, they learn to understand them, and they react appropriately. Uh, mongoose, uh, mongooses eavesdrop on hornbill calls, Okay, so this is interspecies uh, uh, eavesdropping. Chickadees, these little birds, act as a guard for up to 50 other bird species who overhear the alarm calls and gather to mob the predators away from the site. All these little birds come and, you know, beat the predator away. And uh, that's because they can understand each other. Uh, and uh, so this is interesting. This species doesn't talk. They don't have any calls, but they learn to hear and to interpret the calls of seagulls, okay? Uh, and there are different contexts of eavesdropping. Uh, so there is competition. These squirrels and blue jays, I think they hide their food in the same places. So it's important for them to learn the speech of others to kind of see where they're hiding their food, stuff like that. So they compete, compete for the hiding places. Uh, so there's corpora uh, uh, cooperation, it's the opposite, right? These little birds understand each other and they want to unite uh, and uh, fight the, the predator. Uh, this is prey eavesdropping on predators. So these guys understand uh, infrared signals. These people learn to utilize that. They wave their tails and they produce a certain misleading infrared signal to uh, to scare this off, okay? Uh, and these species of fireflies, uh, here the predators fake the call of the prey. So one of the firefly species is a predator, the other one is a prey. The predator who wants to eat the prey fakes uh, a mating call of the prey. The prey comes to the call and gets eaten, okay? So all these different uh, scenarios are possible in um, the animal world. In humans, eavesdropping is uh, essential when two groups of people are at war, in competition, or are, hide are hiding something from each other. So tribal conflicts, criminal slang, OK? 
Okay, we want to hide things from each other. Youth slang, they want to hide something from us. Um, so here, uh, communicating pair uh, is uh, the traditional computer science approach, as I mentioned, one speaker, one here. And now we add an <laughs> eavesdropper. Uh, and we want to explore uh, how this influences the evolution of language. So actually, this is an interesting, this can be generalized in many interesting ways. Because uh, before, let's call this a communication network. It's a very simple communication network. Just two people are connected, right? This makes it less trivial. This is a more compli complex communication network. And you can make it even more complex. Uh, so this is the first step in trying to uh, understand how these more complex, complex communication networks affect the evolution of language. Um, and uh, so let's suppose we have uh, N communicating ag agents, each equipped with a language, M different languages. I apologize for change of notations because I didn't match the two talks. And so uh, we'll look at uh, languages in different com configurations just to explore what can happen. So here, uh, this language is a subset of uh, the next language. So we can say that this one is more complex than this, okay? If it encloses uh, it. And this is a non-hierarchical chain. We just, but we can say that this language is further away from this language than this language. So we can kind of measure the di distance between languages. So these are artificial you know, configurations of different sets. And uh, so let's suppose that she's a speaker or sender, and he's uh, the receiver. And they both get a payoff for talking or understanding. And we assume this time that uh, the payoff may be different. Okay, So she gets something from conveying the information to him. He gets something for receiving the information. It's not necessarily the same value. Uh, and he gets something too. So he gets the information. Uh, he gets a payoff. And because he overheard their information, maybe it's secret information, so you, you have a negative term here because they lose something because he overheard it. Like if two uh, uh, animals talk about a source of food and the third one comes and overhears it, he can go get there faster and eat it. So basically, uh, that's the uh, cost. So we have gain coefficients and we have cost coefficients. And, and we have a, a cost uh, for... Uh, which is a result of eavesdropping. Okay, so after a number of interactions, the population is updated based on the individual's fitness, uh, and we have a mutation matrix, like, just like before. Okay, so let's consider a hierarchical language set. And first, let's forget eavesdropping. Uh, consider a simpler problem uh, where we assume that the payoff for sending and the payoff for receiving are different. Okay, so uh, this is a language in that uh, hierarchical set. So a language with a higher index is more complex than the language with a lower index. This is time. And as evolution progresses, we can see that the most commonly spoken language gets more and more complicated. You, they all start with speaking language one, the, the smallest of the set. And then just as you let the dynamics run, no, no eavesdropping, just this condition the language gets more and more complex. Here, for the, in the opposite case, if you start with the most complicated language, it gets simpler and simpler and simpler. This is uh, easy to understand why this is. Uh, because, so each person at different times is a sender and a receiver. As a sender, I want to get my payoff uh, as, as much as I can. So I want you to understand what I say. So I speak as simply as I can, because I want to maximize, maximize the, the payoff. As a receiver, I also want to maximize my payoff. So my language should be as complex as possible because I want to understand all of you. Okay? And if my payoff as a receiver, if it's more important to understand than to speak, then people will tend to evolve their languages to a higher complexity. So the population, uh, the, the languages go uh, up in complexity. In the opposite case, when it, it's more important to, un to understand, no, I'm sorry, to, to be understood, then you speak uh, uh, more, more simply. So there, there are interesting consequences of that if you consider various applications in economics and so on, which I won't go into. Now, uh, let's suppose, oh, and uh, 
this presents the same thing uh, as a you know stationary pre uh, distribution of frequencies. It's a stochastic process that goes to some sort of a steady state. In steady state, uh, we have if this if the payoff for sending and receiving is the same, we have this line. All languages are presented could be represented with the same frequency. If the payoff for receiving is higher, we have a peak at most, most complex languages. And this is the opposite peak in the opposite scenario. Now, um, uh, here I just say that we can explain all of this not just by computer simulations, but by using the same theory I talked to you before. It can, adapt, can be adapted uh, to include eavesdropping. Because the same language dynamics equations can be solved to, to understand all these things. Um, so now, eavesdropping. Let's suppose that we don't have this discrepancy between uh, sending and receiving. So in principle, uh, there is no dynamics in terms of complex complexification or simplification of the language. But now I, I add eavesdroppers in the population and see what happens. This is the percentage of the probability to be eavesdropped upon. Okay, so when the probability of eavesdropping is significant, we can see that there is a significant peak at the more complex languages. So to, to, put, to, to put this simply, if there is eavesdropping going on in the population, the language has a tendency to get more and more complex. Okay, so this is the message uh, from this. So, so far, both populations eavesdropped on each other. Uh, in an asymmetric model, one population eavesdrops on the other. So, for instance, we have uh, criminals and we have good citizens. And uh, they are not, uh, it's not a symmetrical situation. Only one is interested in hiding something from the other one. So this is the language of the good citizens. This is the language of criminals. And as time goes by, the language of the criminals becomes more complex because they're interested in understanding more. Right? They, they understand their own slang. They have their own slang. But they also understand the language of the good citizens. So in some sense, their language is more complex. It encompasses everything that these people say, but it has more. Okay. So in this simple model of eavesdropping, you can explain this phenomenon. Um, now, forget hierarchy, forget complexification. And we look at the chain of languages, non-hierarchical chain. And here, this model is uh, useful because you can measure distances between languages. You can see how far apart they are from each other. And um, now, let's suppose we have a population of uh, one species uh, eavesdrops on the other. Okay, and we have uh, the gain for eavesdropping, and we have a cost of eavesdropping. Uh, so, depending on the interplay between these two, we have two different situations. Here, you can see that the language of uh, the uh, first population uh, meanders, it changes, okay, as time goes by. But the language of the eavesdroppers follows very closely because they want to understand. These are trying to escape, but since the payoff for eavesdropping is larger, uh, they always can catch up. In the opposite situation, where it's very expensive uh, to, the cost of eavesdropping is very high. So I, don't, I really don't want you to know my secrets, okay? And uh, now you can see the divergence of languages. They, they will never come together. They, they, they repel. Okay. How much time do I have? Two minutes? Okay, fine. So now let, let's go on to something more complex. Uh, something uh, which I didn't talk in my first part, but it, it, it's, it, it goes back to uh, Parta's interpretation of grammar and some other work that we, I've done with him. So we look at languages as a mapping between signals and meanings, or mapping between syntax and semantics. Okay, We have, uh, for instance, three signals, uh, and we have three meanings that we want to express. And uh, we can, each person can act as a sender and as a receiver. As a sender, I'm in the production mo mode. As a, uh, and as a receiver, I'm, I'm in the reception mode. And to make these matrices, production mode, I take a meaning and I normalize over these signals so, such that these entries in each column add up to one. 
this is my probability to use signal one to express this meaning. This is my probability to use signal two and signal three. So these are probabilities. This is my mode of interpretation. I hear signal two. This is my probability to interpret it as meaning one. This is my probability to interpret it as meaning two and so on. Right. So I take this matrix, I normalize it over columns or rows, and I get these two. So uh, this structure gives rise to a, a language space which is more complex than before. It's neither hierarchical nor chain-like. So before I had one language is inside the other always. Or they go like a chain and I can measure distance. Here it's something more complicated, right? Uh, if I consider... So my, my, my language space is basically now uh, the space of all such matrix, matrices. For simplicity, let's assume that all the uh, entries are integer and there is a cap. For instance, they cannot go more than 100. So I, I want a finite space, okay? So it, it's, it's a sp language space of very complicated structure. Uh, and uh, in this uh, space, I can probably observe both complexifi complexification and simplification and uh, diversification and convergence, like I, I showed you before, okay? These two different trends. So, and in particular, we were interested in um, thinking about synonyms and why synonyms are there. Okay, so what's a synonym? Let's suppose that th this meaning can be ex expressed in two ways, signal one and signal two, with these probabilities. Uh, so these two are synonyms because they express the same thing, right? Uh, and these are homonyms. These are, this is a signal that has three different meanings. Oh, two different, different, two different meanings. Okay. So let's try to understand the emergence of synonyms in the language. And I consider the simplest, uh, one of the simplest possible matrices. It's a two by one matrix. It has one meaning that it wants to express and two possible signals. Okay. Uh, and the entries here, uh, let's suppose they add up to a certain number, A and A capital minus A. If one of them is zero, it means that I don't have a synonym and I only use one signal to express this meaning. If both of them are non-trivial, then these are two synonyms that express the same, okay? And um, I run my simulations uh, and let's suppose that memory takes a little bit of a, has a little bit of a cost. Let's charge uh, people for having extra signals in the language, okay? In this case, um, we have this situation, so no eavesdropping. Uh, everybody either has the first entry or the second entry, and nothing in between, okay? In the absence of eavesdropping, uh, the population converges to one language where everybody uses the same one signal to express this meaning, okay? As soon as I add eavesdropping, the situation changes completely. In the presence of eavesdropping, it's, uh, it pays off to use more signals to express the, uh, the same meaning, to confuse them. Okay, this is done to confuse the, the eavesdroppers. And you can see it mathematically, you can prove it mathematically that th this is indeed uh, the state that you converge to. Okay, so adding a little bit of eavesdropping uh, overrides the cost of having extra signals and uh, the population starts speaking in synonyms, uses different words to express the same thing. Uh, this shows the same thing. So uh, this is, I have a population of say of 100 individuals and I look at the first entry of their matrices. Each person has a matrix, uh, language matrix. I look at the first entry and this is time. Here everybody has the first entry one and the other entry zero. And then language switches for some reason because there are mutations in, in this process. Now everybody uses the other signal, but they never use both. I add eavesdropping and everybody always uses both, both uh, signals, okay? Let's see if I can observe the same phenomenon in, in, in a more complex uh, case. I have two meanings now and three possible signals, okay? Um, so more than one element in a column corresponds to a synonym. And um, so in the absence of eavesdropping, uh, here's my dynamics. So remember that matrix two by three, this is a matrix two by three as a function of time. So for instance, at the beginning, entry one was zero for everybody. Entry two was zero for everybody. 
Entry three was one. So it corresponds to this. You see this matrix. Uh, I have a third entry, uh, non-zero, and uh, th this entry is here. Okay. So everybody, uh, almost everybody in the population had this language matrix where we have two signals and two separate meanings. And then language evolves. Sometimes things switch around, but we always kind of keep uh, this one-to-one uh, -one correspondence between a signal and a meaning. And one signal always gets unused because it's an extra one. Nobody wants to have synonyms. I add eavesdropping. And now, look, there, these are two synonyms. These are two synonyms. These are two synonyms. These are two synonyms. So the language changes, but we all, it's always better to keep synonyms as long as the uh, eavesdropping is uh, taking place in the, in the system. Uh, now, let's uh, add some more complexity, and maybe we can observe other things. So uh, having a synonym in the language is a sign of complexification. The language with synonyms is more complex in a sense, or in my very restricted sense, than a language without synonyms. Now we want to see if we can see, uh, if we can observe um, convergence and divergence of languages, okay? So for that, we have to expand our space a little bit. So in the absence of eavesdropping, population will always, conver always converge to a self-consistent language, which maximizes the communicability. So it's going to be a binary matrix like this where there's only one entry in each row and in each column, like this or like this or like this. Okay, so this is what we're going to have in the absence of eavesdropping. Now, um, this, I show this uh, in a different way. Again, this is a function of time, and all the entries are like this. And I assume that um, now I have two populations. One population is eavesdropping on the other, and the cost of eavesdropping is small, the gain for eavesdropping is large. So it's very good to overhear what they say, and they don't really care. So now I, uh, you can't really see it, but I have two lines, black and gray. And you can see that they're almost on top of each other. So the languages are the same. The language of eavesdroppers converges to the language of the, the victim population, right? Because of this uh, condition. Uh, in the opposite scenario, I don't know if you can see uh, or gray from black here, but they are never together. So if, it's, if the cost of eavesdropping is very large, the population of victims will always modify their language to avoid being understood by the eavesdroppers. So there's a certain repulsion between the two, between the two languages. And now the most interesting case, when the two are similar, okay? It's good to be able to understand for the eavesdropper and it's kind of bad if they understand you, as uh, if the eavesdropper understand you, but the two are comparable effects. So now it's the same, the time axis is the same, the same number of time steps. And you can see that the languages here were quite stable. They never changed within this time frame. Here we have a lot of instability because one population, it's the same picture magnified. One population is trying to escape the other population is trying to catch up, the eavesdroppers, okay? Uh, so we have this relative instability in the system. Uh, and there's a run and catch dynamics. You can see that one of the, of the population changes their language such that we have a different correspondence between uh, meanings and signals. And the other one very quickly follows because they, they, they want to catch up with them. The other ones try to escape and they, they catch up with them again. Um, and this is the most interesting thing. So uh, the target population may even sacrifice its communicability to escape from the eavesdropping. So at some point, you have a matrix like this. So you see the lost meaning too. They prefer not to talk about that thing at all because uh, this makes the other ones more confused. Okay, so uh, to confuse, uh, the eavesdroppers, the target population sacrifices their own ability to understand each other, okay? And, and their, their own, they shrink their own vocabulary. Uh, so, and we observe all sorts of interesting things like this, okay? So, um, to conclude, so eavesdropping affects the course of language evolution in uh, interesting ways. And the important aspects 
So there, there are all sorts of things that can be observed. Uh, and we will observe some of them or others depending on the um, biological system, right? So what's important? The underlying language space structure, if it's a hierarchical organization or a chain of languages or something more complex. Uh, the structure of communication networks is important, right? Do we have eavesdroppers? And it, this can be made more complex. And another very important parameter here is the payoffs for eavesdropping relative to the cost of communicating pair. How bad is it that they eavesdrop on me? Or, and how good is it to eavesdrop? How, how much payoff do I get for that? And uh, two main trends, two, two main patterns that we observed here. Language complexification uh, as a result of eavesdropping and uh, language convergence or uh, diversification. Uh, and uh, uh, the presence of eavesdropping can explain the emergence of synonyms in natural languages. Thank you very much.